It's Rima Breakfast here with Andrew and Josh, and joined now by Jeff McPherson from Grace Theological College. G'day there, Jeff. Talofa, indeed. Always good to have you here to ask the, answer the big questions we've had. And uh, we had one that was text through this morning for you. Yeah, so this text, Jeff, came through from Lee. It says this, If God is light and darkness is a theme of evil, why did God create darkness slash night when he created the world? Why wasn't it just created with light all the time and then darkness only included at the fall? Ooh, why did God X, Y, Z? I mean, it almost <laughs> feels like half of our theological questions can be boiled down to that, right? Like, God did it this way. Why did he do it? And then we're left as pe- as mere mortals or theologians, as the case may be, to try and fill in the blanks. Yeah, actually, it was. can I just digress on that for one minute? Yeah, um, go for it. In a class I was teaching last night, you know, we were pondering some deep questions. And I just reminded the class that so often the why questions come up because we don't start with God himself and understand the character of God, you know, mm. understand when we understand who God is, then often that um, better, it under, it helps us to answer those questions, those why questions. You know, why does God do this and why does God not do that? Um, but, hey, let's come back to this question. So, um, why, yeah, why light and darkness? So it is true that the light is used a lot in the Bible and darkness is, a, is both a metaphor and a description of God. God dwells in unapproachable light. Um, we, we, you know, we pray, let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. Um, and, and yes, God does bring, um, you know, he, he shines his light into creation. He dispels the darkness. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the deep. And God said, what, you know, let there be light. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, but then also God does say, um, this is Isaiah 45. So through the prophet Isaiah, he says, I form light and create darkness. I make well being and create calamity. So it seems that God you know, intentionally does allow darkness to occur also. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, um, I mean, again, it kind of, when you're speaking about the character of God and all these sorts of things as well, sometimes it's enough to say that whatever God's reasons were, they don't change the fact that he is a loving God who cares for us, who, you know, wants the best for us, wants us to come into a relationship with him, right? Um, it's It almost reminds me of the conversations you can have with, like, a, a three-year-old at some point, where you say, well, there's an element to which... You might not even be able to take on board the answer, but you're in relationship with me, so you can know whatever I'm doing is because ultimately I do love and care for you. Yeah, and and, and that's right. So this is coming back again to the character of God and and His reasons. You know, we're not. This is the difficulty, isn't it? Like as you say, you're talking about a parent and a child. You can't always explain to a small child, can you? You know, mm. this is why. You know, you need to allow that doctor to. That's stick hard that enough to explain in. to an adult, Jeff. <laughs> um, but hey here's the really other interesting thing about the darkness and light and darkness thing you know it, it um i i was reminded that you know when god comes down on sinai yeah um, oh, yeah. that's right so yeah you remember it too so the people we're told the people stood far off while moses drew near to the thick darkness where god was mm. um and so this is darkness being used as a metaphor of awesomeness mm. and of almost of holiness um when david you know psalm 18 it, uh, i'll read you two verses there it says he bowed down the heavens and came down thick darkness was under his feet he made darkness his covering his canopy was around him thick clouds dark with water so that's a picture of awesomeness of majesty of just like well you know you want to stand back and go don't get in the way of this guy you know kind mm. of thing yeah, and um, look, even as you're saying it too, one possible dimension of this could also be, I defer to you on this one, of course, uh, but God has also built this place that we live in to be time-bound. You know, we live in a temporal kind of state, whereas, of course, God does not. So our whole, the whole of creation seems to also be built around this cycle of light and dark, light and dark, not metaphorical light and dark, but just even the regeneration that happens. And um Dare I say it, Jeff, even the idea of when Jesus is placed in the tomb, you know, he goes into darkness and then comes back out into light again. That cycle of kind of rebirth is something that God uses to just reveal a little bit more of his nature to us. Yeah. And and just, you know, because you mentioned Christ in the tomb, when you come into the New Testament, um, darkness does, the light and darkness does become a lot more binary. Mm. Um, 
in the New Testament, and and I may and I stand to be corrected. I may be wrong, but it's almost exclusively used of good and bad. You know, of for example, you know, the one who hates his brother is in darkness. Right. Uh, he came to rescue us from darkness, and so you have these contrasts. You know, from above and below light and darkness and jesus is the one who came to bring the good news to those who dwell in darkness you know and um there is darkness is used of sadness think of the crucifixion mm. midday midday to 12 uh is it three o'clock i think it yeah. was you no know, darkness was over the land um but yeah darkness becomes more of a spiritual metaphor in the new testament and and you know, the gospel is about bringing light out of darkness. Mm, interesting. Well, look, I hope, uh, Lee, that's answered your question or at least uh, illuminated it a little bit for you today. And we have another question for you, Jeff. Are you ready? Okay, give it a crack. Prime, psyched, and ready to go. Okay, so, Jeff, this one came through as well. How much influence do my decisions have on God's plan for my life? How much do my own choices influence the plan that God has already set out for me? Oh, you see, this is great. I mean, I guess there's a number of dimensions we can take on this one too, but even on a personal level, Jeff, I mean, haven't we all had that moment where we're like, what does God want me to do in this situation? And I suppose sometimes it leads to a bit of analysis paralysis, right? We're afraid of doing the wrong thing, so we don't do anything. What's your take on that one this morning? Yeah, yeah, this, this, I completely understand that, um, that dilemma and, and I've encountered it and, you know, pastorally, it, it comes up quite a lot as well. People wanting to know what's the right decision, or sometimes they say it this way, what is God's will? Mm. Because they're told you have to, you know, do God's will for your life. Sure. <laughs> so, um, well, here's the thing, you know, we, the Bible makes it really clear that God is sovereignly in control. So he, he is the, you know, the buck stops of them. He is the boss. He, he determines, he organizes, he, plans everything that comes about but there's a couple of fences though that are helpful for us to to remember um first of all god is he never is the author of sin mm. um so you know james 1 13 tells us that god never tempts anyone to sin he never makes anyone to sin so god is never going to make you sin um and also he he never will violate the will of you know you know your will um when God plans things, we actually join. Um, how do we say it? we will willingly join in on God's plans? Mm. You know, um, when Peter stood up in the day of Pentecost and he's preaching to the crowd there, yeah, and he says um, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, but he said you crucified and killed him. Right. Now, did they want to crucify and kill Jesus? The people he was talking to, yeah, they wanted to do it. They were like crucify and crucify him. But he said that was God's plan. That was God's purpose um, that you that you did that. And and then the third thing I think is is that um, God uses ordinary kind of everyday what we call secondary causes. Um, you know, so God works through means. He doesn't just zap you right to the end. So hey, let's come back to the question. You want to know God's will, God's perfect will. Well, you the there's two ways of answering that. Is one is you cannot know God's perfect will because there is a secret counsel of God that we we don't mm, know. Yeah. But we do know what God tells us. Mm. And God, you know, reveals his, himself to us authoritatively in the Bible. Um, but he's revealed himself in Christ. He reveals himself by his spirit to us also. Well, Jeff, what do you think of this metaphor? Because I heard this one via, I believe it was actually Dave Riddell, who's a fairly well-known uh, Christian psychologist. But he said, sometimes the dilemma comes from how you view God has set the world up around us. And he says that you can look at it as either a blueprint or as a sandbox. And he said the blueprint people are the ones who say that there is a specific way that things have to fit together. And if you don't do it exactly that way, then you're in big trouble and the whole thing falls apart. And, of course, downstream of that, there's a lot of stress and anxiety and those sorts of things. However, my understanding is is he's more of the belief, too, that you've got to see life as more like a, a sandbox, a sandpit, that there are boundaries around things that you cannot overstep. But actually within that, there's an enormous amount of freedom to do all sorts of things that would all count as, you know, quote unquote, within God's will, you know, should I help this person or should I go to this place and visit the, this friend? Well, both of those things can be perfectly legitimate ways of expressing what God has done in your life. Or, you know, should I sleep in on Saturday morning or should I go for a run? I mean, again, you can do both and 
neither of them or both of them, if you want to look at it that way, are uh, in, in conflict with, you know, with, with what God wants for your life. It's just certain things, like you say, God will never cause you to sin or step outside certain boundaries. Yeah, that, and those are really helpful illustrations. I, I hadn't heard those, but they're great. I mean, because um, I, another way I've heard it explained, maybe in a more practical way, is that um, if you want to know what God's will is, you know, you, you pick up the Bible, you read the Bible, you pray, you know, you seek to be illuminated by the Spirit of God, and you do what is you do what is in your heart as you conform yourself, as you bring yourself in alignment with God's thinking. Mm. Uh, and and that's really, I, I don't think God actually asks any more from us. I don't think in his character, his character is ultimately one of, of mercy and of patience towards us mm. and and a desire that we, you know, we, we live in, in, a, in a fellowship and, and um, you know, I love the old Westminster Confession uh, catechism question. They, they ask, you know, what is the chief end of man? And it says man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Mm. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Actually, even as you say that too, I'm thinking that it can be a reflection of how we're even approaching God and relating to him as well. We've spoken a lot already this morning about our relationship with God as opposed to maybe seeing him as one who just gives us a bunch of guidelines and rules to live our life by. And I wonder sometimes if um, it can reveal in our own life maybe a lack of personal trust in who God is, that mm. uh, when we've got something ahead of us to do, well, I've experienced in my life when I think I've made the best choice and I've experienced God closing a door or directing that way, but it doesn't happen until after I've kind of taken a step. And one thing that was kind of comforting in some ways to discover was when I started moving down a certain path and going like, oh, well, God is able to close a door or open a door beyond my ability and maybe out of my own egotism in the past, Jeff, I thought, well, if I go down this path, this is all going to happen because obviously, you know, I'm going to do all these kind of things. And yet God's able to say, I got you, kid. Don't worry. If it's the wrong path, I can show you that. But it's a relational thing, not just a, a list of to-dos or a tick box, right? Yeah. And, and again, it comes back to, you know, something we touched on right at the very start is the, the character of God, yeah, um, the nature of God, you know, that God is, yeah, he's He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's, he's um immutable you know all of these beautiful things about god he's nothing changes his character and his will and yet he condescends he he has made us in his image and likeness because he desires relationship with us sin has marred that he's all about restoring that and so for us as for a believer you know it's about coming to god as best we can trusting in his kindness and his mercy not in our merit you know mm. god God doesn't love us because we're so cool and we're cooler than the other kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's not why he picked us. He picked us in his mercy and in his kindness in Jesus Christ. Never never leave the gospel out of it. You know, when Paul talks about predestination, election, and that kind of thing, he always says it's in Christ Jesus, it's in him, you know, in the gospel. So yeah, it's I think I think un understanding, studying, understanding the character of God more will help us to just feel more. At, let's say at ease about these kinds of questions. Mm, I love that. It's a great place to wrap up on today, Jeff. So um, thanks for diving in once again with a couple of questions for us today. You're welcome. Great to chat again. And of course, if you've ever got a uh, question you want us to run past Jeff in future, you're welcome to text it through to us, 8168, with the first word, Rima, and we'll pick it up again the next time we get together for Theological Thursday. Hey, we really hope you enjoyed that video. Make sure you like and subscribe and turn your notifications on. And I uh, hope you enjoy the next one. Yeah, we'll catch you then.